Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over the first Cars Passage in the new AMC free practice exam that just dropped and I'm not sure exactly what to call it. They're calling it free practice exam. Kind of anticlimactic to me. So if y'all want to call it FLE5, um, if y'all want to call it sample test number two, like that's kind of what I've been calling it. But Moral of the story is, if you've been following our channel for a while, then you know that me and my brother John are med students in the southeastern United States, but we used to be professional MCAT tutors. We went through the entire first AAMC sample test and kind of broke down all those passages and gave better explanations than the AAMC gave, which is really not a hard task to do at all. So now that there's another free practice exam out, you know that we had to go through it all. And I'm actually really excited to kind of get back into passage breakdowns because this is kind of like what I think is more fun. So without further ado, we're going to be looking at the first CARS passage in the AMC MCAT official prep free practice exam. Okay, so I should preface this by saying that I'm going to be saying words like main idea, tone, arguments, intentions, those kinds of things. And if you're not familiar with what those words are, you should definitely go check out mine and John's cars series it's three videos that kind of teach you exactly what to look for in a cars passage and kind of demystifies that section since it gives so many students so much trouble including myself when i was studying so the way i like to do this is read through the passage and i'm going to stop and tell you guys like like kind of talk aloud how i would be thinking about it in my head uh, if i was reading this through for the first time so looking at the passage, I always like to scroll down and see what the title is. And it looks like it's called Aramis or the love of technology. So that sounds like they're either going to actually love technology or it's going to be like a joke and like they're being sarcastic. So it says, as accustomed as we have become to the idea that scientists construct theories and produce explanations, and regardless of the controversies among scientists, the fact remains that they only disclose to us a world that came into being without the scientists or other human contributions. So only is strong language here. Also, the opening sentence is usually pretty important because it's really going to uh, set the tone for the rest of the passage. And the author could, of course, switch up and decide that they're going to explain an idea and then change their mind halfway throughout. And we need to be cognizant of that. But a lot of times they're going to put forth an idea in the first sentence and it's going to carry throughout the passage. So what is the author saying here? Kind of a little bit of science slander. You see these quotations like they construct theories and produce explanations. That's being sarcastic. The author's saying, y'all think that scientists build all this stuff, produce, construct, and these theories and these explanations, but really they were there before. They just kind of discovered them. Galileo may have conceptualized and formalized the phases of Venus, but the phases themselves had manifestly always existed. Just adding on. Galileo's fabricated hypothesis simply became the acknowledged fact. By contrast, in conceptualizing technological projects, engineers produce fictions. The technology concern does not, and by definition could not, exist since it is in the project phase. So it sounds like this author is not being sarcastic about the love of technology that was in the title. It sounds like, for real, engineers greater than scientists at this point, because they actually, like, come up with something completely new, fabricate it out of thin air, whatever. I'm going to uh, highlight this part that says engineers produce fictions just because I feel like that's like a main point that, that the author's trying to drive home. Like they're obviously juxtaposing engineers and scientists. So I want to know what they think about what engineers do and what they think about what scientists do. This tautology frees the analysis of technological proposals from the burden of confirmation necessary in the analysis of scientific hypothesis. One might argue, of course, that Diesel did not create the principles he applied in his engine any more than Galileo created the astronomical principles he observed, and some would even contend that the engine was therefore as much beyond the control of Diesel as Venus was beyond the control of Galileo. But notice how he's saying one might argue, and some would even contend, but not them. Like, the author feels the way that they felt in the first paragraph. They're drawing a line to other ideas that may be out there, but this is not their stance. 
Even so, few would seriously defend the proposition that the diesel engine had always existed and needed only to be discovered. In reference to technology, Platonism is considered an extreme philosophical stance. So I don't know what Platonism is, but I'm guessing it's what they literally just described in the sentence beforehand, that the diesel engine had always been existed and just needed to be discovered. I'm just going to keep that in my head. The rejection of Platonism means greater freedom for those who study machinery than for those who study nature. The big issues of reality and plausibility do not bother the former. Engineers may freely create fictions since the projection of a technological possibility from the present or from 5 or 50 years in the future to a time t is a part of their job. They invent a non-existent means of transportation with paper passengers, opportunities yet to be created, hypothetical places to be served, often to be designed themselves from scratch. New component industries and assumed technological revolution. This kid loves some engineers. So kind of, kind of uh, giving us a new argument at this point. But the author is kind of saying here that engineers are really um, like creatives and that they can project possibilities into the future um, that may not exist now, which is kind of the whole point of their job is what uh, they're saying. They are novelists with one difference. Their project, although initially indistinguishable from a novel, will either remain a possibility in a file or be transformed into an object. So now engineers are better than literary novelists. So let's stop here for a second. And I want to, this is kind of what I do when I'm going through a car's passage. Like I like to come up with an idea, usually from the very beginning, the very first one or two sentences, come up with like a short main idea. And as I'm going through the passage and I get more, um, arguments and I get more of the tone and I get more uh, evidence, then I um, uh, make amendments to my main idea. And once I get to the end, I should have like a fully fledged main idea. It's all in my head. I don't write it down until the end, but yeah. So we started out kind of saying like engineers and technology is greater than science because science just kind of discovers things. Whereas engineers actually like make things. This really didn't add anything to me to the main idea, um, but it did give us a word, Platonism. So I may want to include that because it just seems like something that they might ask about. Then we come up on this uh, paragraph that kind of gives us this idea that um, engineers are like super creative because they're making these things and they they can project things into the future, these ideas, and um, they're even better than novelists more creative because what they uh, start thinking about may actually um, become an object one day. At first, projects and the objects to which they pertain are indistinguishable. The two concepts circulate from office to office in the form of plans, memos, discussions, skill models, and occasional synopsis. In this stage of signs, language, and text, people influence the object. But once the project is realized and the object real, it is people outside their offices who are influenced by it. A Copernican revolution. So here's another small idea that um, uh, first uh, an object that is created by an engineer is um, influenced by humans and then eventually it starts influencing humans after it's made. Kind of a new idea. The gulf between the world of symbols and the world of things is then apparent. The R. 312 is no longer a fiction that carries me away in transports of delight. It is a bus that transports me along the Boulevard St. Mitchell. So that's just evidence for the idea that they introduced in the paragraph. Still, the creators of technology do not rigidly differentiate symbol from thing, project from object, the novel that excites speculation from the reality inscribed in the nature of things. For as the R312 passes progressively from fiction to fact, its engineers repeatedly pass between the speculative and the practical realms. So kind of introducing a sort of new idea here that um, although all these things are true, that an object moves from fiction to fact, essentially, 
that the creators of technology, these engineers do not actually rigidly differentiate between that because they are constantly kind of thinking about them, I guess, in the same in the same way. The capacity to be liberated from an exclusive concern reality and to soar into unrealized potential is the quality that gives technological fiction a beauty that the literary novel, a form inherited from the naturalistic 19th century, has difficulty in approaching. So you see, they're kind of honestly saying naturalistic in a bad way, uh, because that's that's in the sciences realm. Naturalists, that's in the science realm. That's where we just discover things that nature already gave us. And he's saying that the literary novel, novel uh, the form, I guess, that we read now, I don't know, was inherited from this naturalistic 19th century. And so that's why it's still not as good as technology. Only a fiction that is capable of gaining or losing reality can do justice to engineers, those great unhonored figures of culture and history. You have got to be kidding me. A fiction with a variable structure. It is this flexibility to which we must aspire in tracking a technological project. Okay, so we wrapped it up, and I kind of like to go back and read the first sentence again. Yeah, basically, scientists suck. Okay, now let's wrap up all of the arguments that we were given and that kind of uh, amended main idea that we had uh, and put it into a true main idea and include, um, you know, the tone of the author, what the author likes and dislikes, obviously dislikes sciences, uh, likes technology. So you can see at the top here that I kind of already wrote my main idea. I said... Uh, technology is greater than literature or science because technology can imagine realities that don't exist yet, but draw lines to objects that will slash do exist, a true rejection of Platonism. I threw that little thing about Platonism in just for kicks. But you can see how like I'm kind of getting all those things that we talked about in the passage in my main idea. If you feel like getting a main idea is really difficult, don't worry I felt like that too for months and months and months. The best way to go about it is truly just to read stuff like literally anything and stop after a few paragraphs and try to like purposely get a main idea and time yourself when you're doing this. Practicing Cars passages, I recommend the Cars Q pack from AMC. I recommend like any free Cars practice you can get. But try to formulate a main idea, and then after you formulate it, read back through and be like, did I miss anything? Of course, you're not going to be able to get those little details and um, that extra evidence, but usually the author is going to like present an idea and then follow it up with evidence and examples and stuff like that, which is basically just hammering their point home. And that lets you know that that point is important to the author, and so you should include part of it in your main idea. Again, I totally recommend our our videos on condensing to the main idea, and I will link those in the description below. So let's start now on the questions. Which of the following phrases best expresses the sense of Platonism that is conveyed in the passage? Paragraph 2. I told y'all this Platonism thing was going to come in handy. I was like, that word... Just looks like something that they're going to ask a question about. So they did mention the paragraph, so I actually do want to go and look a little bit at it. Listen to me, even if they mention the paragraph, do not spend more than 10 seconds here. So this is the one that um, he was talking about diesel and how nobody would say that the engine was already created. That was Platonism. So it says, A, the expression of the human spirit through the realm of ideas. I don't really think it had anything to do with the human spirit. If I was to to say what I think Platonism is, I would say I think Platonism is the idea that um, like things are already there and they just have to be discovered. B, the derivation of cause and effect from observable relationships. I'm not really sure like what relationship that we'd be talking about here um, or cause and effect. Um, I just, I want to find a better answer. See the pre-existence of concepts that are the prototypes of real objects. Yeah, I like that. Kind of what I was saying, pre-existence of concepts, everything exists, we really just have to discover it, and that are the prototypes of real objects, that would be like the engine. It's a real object, um, and the concept that's the prototype of that real object is already in existence. So I like that, but always read all your answer choices. D says the inseparability of physical matter and the particular form it takes. Um, We're talking about like concepts here, the inseparability of like concepts and physical matter, not necessarily physical matter and 
a particular form. The term Copernican revolution refers to the demonstration by Copernicus that the apparent daily orbiting of Earth by the sun is illusory and that Earth actually orbits the sun. In applying this term to a different phenomenon, which in paragraph four, what idea does the author evidently mean to imply? So again, I want to go back to paragraph four because it specifically mentioned it, but I'm not going to spend more than 10 seconds here. This is where they mentioned Copernican revolution, and it was when they were talking about um, how an object is influenced by people, but then it switches and it starts influencing people after it's made. So the question is basically asking, what does the author mean by that? Hopefully you've been able to grasp kind of what the author was saying initially. Um, but if you're not, then t slow down and think about it a little bit. The Copernican revolution was saying, um, the sun revolves around the earth, but then Copernicus was like, no, it's like this complete reversal. And same thing with technology and humans, you know, uh, uh technology is kind of revolving around humans at the beginning and, uh, humans are influencing it, but eventually humans kind of are influenced by the object, complete reversal. A, an object that is designed according to engineering principles is as real as a scientific finding. So I do not think that bringing up Copernicus, um, because that was a scientific finding, uh, had anything to do with the author's, um, whole like I hate scientists thing I think it was more just a demonstration of like complete reversal of ideas in history so I don't really like that be a project that may result in an object remains an illusion until its feasibility is demonstrated so I would argue that this is kind of like exactly the opposite of what the author says like the author saying that the um, ideas behind a project are kind of like the same thing as the project that there's it's hard to draw a line through them so i really don't like that see when an object results from a technological project it becomes equivalent to a natural object so this is kind of saying that like technological products and natural products are the same and i you know author does not like natural things um they they think that that is like lower than technological things so i definitely don't think that's true d when humans must adapt to an object design by humans, the source of control has reversed. So totally what we were saying, right? Complete reversal. I like that one. Number three says, a prototype exists of a solar fuel train with cars that are coupled electronically and that can decouple smoothly at branching points to carry passengers to their destinations without a change of trains. Experts say that this transportation system would eliminate traffic problems. How would the passage author probably answer the objection that the system would be too expensive to build? What do y'all think? This is a tone question. This is not a main idea question. This is giving you a new scenario and saying, how would this author that you have gotten to know over the course of the past like 800 words or whatever, how would they respond to this new scenario? So all we have to go off of is what the author has given us in the passage. Did the author say anything about money? No. Does the author seem like they would care about money when it comes to a technological project? In my opinion, no. It seems to me like the author's like, oh, engineers are so great. Who cares about money? Don't put a cap on their imagination. Like a little like whimsy, whimsical. And that's like really all I have to go off of as far as the uh, money thing goes. Like I, I genuinely don't really know how they would respond. But um, the tone that I've gotten from this author is that like, I mean, Calling engineers the great unhonored un figures of culture and history. I mean, come on. He's not going to put a price on that. So A says, by counseling patients until a cheaper solution is found. This man is not about patients. This man is about projects. This man is about giving engineers what they want, honoring them in history. I don't, I mean, maybe. I'm not going <laughs> to completely mark it out, but like, I don't think so. B, by predicting eventual savings and reduced highway costs. So I like this one better than A, because I feel like, I feel like definitely the author is going to say who gives enough about the money, but this might be the way that they say that by being like, well, eventually we're going to get our monies back. So maybe. C, by pointing out the inconvenience of traffic congestion. Uh, I don't think that that really has anything to do with like the, the question stem because I feel like you could find a different solution that wouldn't be so expensive. Like the problem is like, it's too expensive. Not like that traffic's too bad, like that. Okay. Traffic's too bad. So we came up with a solution, but it's too expensive. Like, 
I feel like we're going back to the beginning of the problem. I don't love it. I like B better. D, by urging policymakers to plan ahead with imagination. Ooh, I like that word. Imagination. Whimsy, okay? Engineers are imaginists, okay? They're much better than scientists and, and novelists. I feel like D matches the tone that the author is desperately trying to get across better than B. Basically, it's like more whimsical, in my opinion. All right, number four says the passage distinction between technology and science does not consider the... So we and notice how I'm like stopping before I go into the answer choices every time. I really urge y'all to do that because you can get bogged down in cars answer choices. And I think you should have an idea of what you want the answer choice to be before you go into the answer choices. So think about the distinction between science and technology in the passage. Science <laughs> and technology is great. But what does that not consider? What I'm going to do is go through these answer choices and think about, mm, did I, do I think that the author did consider that? And then mark it out. The role of imagination in the process of scientific discovery. So actually, okay, the author clearly thinks that, we talked about this in the last question, clearly thinks that um, technology and engineers are like the pinnacle of imagination and whimsy and like, putting a plan to motion. So do you think that the author thought about how much imagination is involved in scientific discovery? Probably not, because then probably the author would give a, put a little respect on scientist's name. So actually, I really like that one, but let's go through and do what I was going to do earlier by marking things out. B, flexibility of technological concepts in the project stage. So I, I think the author considered that, you know, they talked about projects um, or things in the project stage and I, I think that I don't think that there was a, a lack of flexibility or that the author thought that they were like stuck in motion or anything so I think B's probably B was probably considered C the possibility that potential objects may never be realized so that was definitely considered right because um, the author specifically said at one point when comparing to novelists that the technologies may or may not uh, ever be realized. D, um, difference in the work done by engineers and scientists, definitely considered right. Like engineers are so much better than scientists. That was clear, clearly the author's opinion. So I think A, the author did not consider the role of imagination in science. Okay, five, according to the author's account, the experience of working on an engineering project is least like that of so what was the experience of working on an engineering project? Probably going to have to do something with how cool it is. Probably going to have to do something with imagination and something about like um, creation and um, production and construction and all that kind of jazz. So we want to mark out things that are similar to that. A, a chef in imagining the din menu for a dinner. Imagining, here that word comes up again. Clearly, that probably should have been in my main idea. And when you're going through answer choices, you can usually find words that do that or ideas that do that and be like, why does that idea keep coming up? It's probably because it's the main idea. So definitely, um, anything that involves imagination would probably be similar to uh, working on an engineering project in this author's opinion. A reporter in gathering facts for an article. See, that reminds me of what the author thinks that scientists do. They just gather facts. They don't construct anything. They don't produce anything. They just gathering things that are already there. So actually, um, I think that that's probably a good answer choice. See, a travel agent in creating a vacation package. So to me, it's becoming clear that like it's the verbs and... What is D, an artist in making sketches for a funeral? Yeah, so so <laughs> a mural, not a funeral. Um, so it's it, it's kind of clear when you just look at the verbs. What does the author think the engineers do? They imagine, they create, they make, they don't gather. That's what scientists do. So I think probably B is the right answer there. All right, six says, according to social psychologists, people tend to respond to words and symbols as if they were the things to which they refer. What would the passage author most be likely to say about this tendency? Okay, um, be careful with this like question stem 
or like for me because this is worded so weird. People tend to respond to words and symbols as if they were the things to which they refer. So, so self and you know, symbols, whatever, are the same. They are not separated. That's kind of the idea that we need to take from this question stem. What would the passage author say about that? Think, did the passage author say anything about things being lumped together or like the same? If you'll remember, and this is why active reading is so important because like every, every little word matters, like details, I mean, they don't matter, but at the same time, there are times like this when you do want to pull up like one specific example, because they're going to kind of draw a line between it and some other analogy that they're going to pull out of their butts. So you do kind of just want to make sure that you are actively reading every line. So do you remember right here where they said at first projects and the objects to which they pertain are indistinguishable and then um, kind of talks about how these two concepts that are tied together circulate around, but, and then these transition words, um, if you are not very good at active reading or figuring out like uh, twists and turns in the main idea, then, then highlighting transition words like but are going to be helpful. But once the project is realized and the object real, um, you know, that's when the Copernican revolution happens or whatever. The gulf between the world of signal symbols and the world of things is then apparent. So the author says that at first, these things are indistinguishable. They are the same, but eventually they do separate um, and the, the gulf becomes realized or whatever. So A, it must be repeatedly overcome by engineers as a project progresses towards its physical realization. That does line up very well with what we just talked about. Things are together and towards like as you're coming to the physical realization of the object, then things must separate and the concept must stay as a concept and the object must become an object. So I do like that one. B, it accords with the distinction between the hypothesis of scientists and the proposals of engineers. So what is the distinction between the hypotheses of scientists and the proposals of engineers? It's that the proposals of engineers were created and that they will eventually become an object, whereas the hypothesis of scientists were just kind of discovered. So you can also look at the question stem as it's saying um, people tend to respond to words and symbols as if they were the things to which they refer. You can kind of see that as like what the author is saying about scientists. Hang with me here. If we are saying that we are representing something with a symbol, but it always existed, as self. To me, I mean, maybe I'm doing backbends over here, but to me, I can kind of see how the author would think that that's like um, a, a tenet of science, that we are describing something with a theory, but it has always existed as a reality. So I think um, that it would sort of describe that, but I don't think it accords with the distinction between this and the proposals of engineers. Basically, I like A better. C, it explains the failure to honor great engineers who have turned projects into objects. So I don't think, um, I think that's just trying to throw like some keywords in there that we remember from the passage and trying to see if we bite and we shouldn't because really um, the failure to honor great engineers, what does that have to do with um, this thing that social psychologists say? I, I don't understand what they're trying to say here. D, it implies an overemphasis on plans and working models in technological projects. So um, I don't think that this is something that the author would say. I don't think that the author would, would ever say that we plan too much. Because if you remember, like in one of those last paragraphs, it was talking about the planning process. And it never said anything bad about the planning process. So I don't think that that would be um, something the author would agree with. So I think it's um, A. Okay, last question. What belief led the author to contrast the accompl accomplishments of Galileo with those of Diesel? What was the contrast? So Galileo is a silly little scientist, and all he did <laughs> was describe the phases of Venus or whatever, along with a lot of other things. And that Diesel made the diesel engine engineer. So what belief led that? This is obviously a main idea question, because this is basically just saying, why did the author use that example? What were they trying to back up? 
they were trying to back up the main idea. They're always trying to back up the main idea. So A says the natural designs such as the orbit of Venus are variable, whereas technology follows a straight path. No, I would definitely say that the author thinks that there's more variability and imagination involved in technology. B, that a planetary orbit is predetermined, whereas the design of an engine is creative. Totally. I love it. And I'm going to highlight it because I really like it. C, that the discoveries of scientists provided the principles that would later be applied by engineers. So this would be um, a respectful view of scientists, but uh, the author was not um, said nothing about how important science was in the development of technology. So um, no. D, that the phases of Venus provided new knowledge, whereas the engine followed known principles. That was totally opposite, right? That would be like that would be more in line with like Platonism. So B is our best answer there. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed that breakdown because I know I did. We're going to be covering this entire test over the next like several, several weeks. I mean, there's like, what, 39 passages. So make sure if you want to uh, follow along with that, then subscribe to our channel and hit like on this video if you think that I did at least a decent job. I will see you guys in the next video.